What drives you, exile? Is it justice? Revenge? Honor? No. It is power. We felt your deeds. Felt their shockwaves ripple through the void. You have our attention. Now you must keep it. Your limits will be tested. Break them. Do what is thought impossible. And the Atlas will follow. What drives you exile? And the answer to that question, of course, is power. Now I chose that background uh, audio to the intro of this build because I think it's very telling of what PoE is all about. It's about creating the most powerful build you can. And for me, that's what this Giga Guardian is represented because for me, power is defenses and offenses and having a good balance of both, basically making a build that can do everything easily you know i don't have to be good at the game to do all the end game fights with this character i simply just don't because most things the end game throws at me doesn't even hurt and then i can also kill the end game within seconds you know it's not a difficult task because what this build represents to me is power so that's why i chose that intro audio you may recognize it it's from the trailer for basically Echoes of the Atlas when they introduce the Maven, the Maven invitations, and they introduce all this sort of extra end game challenge. And so, I don't know, I just thought that would be a cool intro for the build and just play it with a montage of the character doing some end game fights. Now, what is this character all about? Why do I think this character is so strong defensively and how it works offensively as well? Now, I'm gonna go over some of the core mechanics of this build. It all starts out with, well, a few things to start off with we chose guardian for mainly radiant faith but also the combo potential of being able to steal righteous providence from inquisitor these two things in combination together allow us some interesting uh synergy because radiant faith is an ascendancy point that says hey if you're scaling some life and you're scaling mana and you're reserving it you get power and for us we scale a decent amount of life to get a lot of armor from this node. From our life pool, which is almost 4K, we're getting a little bit over like 6,000 armor or something. That's a lot of flat armor. And then that synergizes well with Ivory Tower, a chess piece that says, hey, for the amount of life you reserve, you get a lot of energy shield. From our life pool, which is close to 4,000, we're getting a little bit over 1,000 flat energy shield. There's not chess pieces on the market that have 1,000 flat ES. So it's something that allows us to A, invest into one stat, which is life, and get two benefits. We're getting, we're getting a lot of ES, and we're also getting a lot of out, a lot of armor. This synergizes with Aegis Aurora, a shield that says, "Hey, based on the amount of armor you have, every time you block, I'm going to give you back ES." So with our character, we get a little bit over 100k. You can push this further if you start like min-maxing the gear better than I did. Uh, that's most certainly possible. The point is, at this level of gearing, you're looking at every time you block, we get 2,000 energy shield back. Now. The important part of this whole synergistic of how I'm trying to get this build to a point where it's 
essentially immortal in majority of like 99% of scenarios is if the enemy can't hit us harder than 2000 damage, they're going to net heal us because if we block their hit, which we will 75% of the time, we will heal for 2000 energy shield. And so we have defensive layers like getting 90 max all res. That means if an enemy hits us for 20,000 damage, elemental damage, they're only going to do 2k damage total. So if they're hitting us for 20k, we're still kind of breaking even. If we block, we then reduce the damage by like 35% because we're glancing blows block. And you get the picture. The idea is if the enemy can't hit us hard enough, the enemy can't kill us. Um, for getting 90 max all res, we use a combination of Melding of the Flesh mixed with Aegis Aurora and Purity of Ice. The way this works is we're getting 5 max res from Aegis and we're getting 10 max res from our Purity of Ice because we have about 100% aura effect in the build. That means 15 max res to cold takes us from 75 to 90 max cold res. And then Melding of the Flesh combines, or combines that synergy to make it so I get 90 max lightning and 90 max fire as well. This means we can run things like Righteous Fire relatively easy with a little bit of regen investment, which we get pretty freely with Guardian. We have, for example, Time of Need, which comes with a bunch of regen, along with 80% curse reduction, which means a lot of map mods don't matter, curses don't feel so bad. We also get regen from Unwavering Faith. Per aura, we get a 0.2% life regen per second. That scales off aura effect, so 0.4% regen per aura. The reason the 100% aura effect uh, basically breakpoint is important, and I go over in the PUB notes section, is because it doubles the 1% fizz reduction to 2% per aura. We have about 9 or 10 auras, so that's that's a good 18%, 20% fizz reduction versus 9 or 10. And that is also important breakpoint for purity of ice to hit 10 max cold res instead of 5. Now, another important, I guess, synergy of this build that I should go over is coruscating elixir now this is probably the most confusing part of the build but the moral of the story is coruscating elixir takes away the downside of ivory tower ivory tower says chaos damage can't bypass your mana pool so it wants you to build into having a high mana pool but that takes a lot of investment and it also means you can't reserve your mana pool since i want to invest into auras i want to get the benefit of being able to reserve quite a bit more auras by reserving my mana pool it also synergizes with guardian giving us es from the mana we do reserve so the point here is we need a way to stop chaos from bypassing our energy shield coruscating elixir is that way now, in order to use Coruscating Elixir, I wouldn't feel comfortable using it unless I could have permanent uptime on this flask. And the way we do that is pretty simply put, the Traitor. This keystone gives us four flash charges per empty flash slot every five seconds. If we have two empty flash slots, that's eight charges. So every single one of our flasks, Coruscating Elixir, Bismuth, and our Quicksilver are getting eight charges every five seconds. Moral of the story is, that's enough charges generation if you get some quality on your Coruscating Elixir to permanently sustain it. It's important to note you want to use the mod that says reuse at the end of the flask's effect. The reason you want to use this craft specifically is it means you activate it at the start of the map and you don't have to think about it ever again because it will continually be active. I should also note the important reason we use this instead of the use when full mod is because the use when full mod can occasionally have uh, downtime based on the um, the break points of if you get eight charges every five seconds we're gonna get 24 charges within 15 seconds but when this flask runs up which is at 12 seconds we'll have only gotten 16 charges so it's a little bit there's gonna be that awkward space where there's like downtime in your flask even though you have enough charge generation to keep it on basically permanently there will be downtime if you use the other mod so that's why I recommend this one. It also means you're going to be activating it as little times as possible. So you'll always have the 12 second duration of you can have Righteous Fire on during this flask. Now I mentioned Righteous Fire because this flask specifically turns your life to one. It takes whatever life you have and, and sets it to one. This turns off Righteous Fire. Righteous Fire has a condition that turns off when your life reaches one. So the idea is we want this to activate as little times as possible but have permanent uptime that's why we use the enchant reuse at the end of the flask use and that's also why we use doriani's lessons doriani's lessons allows us to leech life in this build we want to have our life regen apply to our es because we have a big es pool that's what we care about sustaining but that also means we don't have a way of getting our life back 
and we need a way to put our life above one to reactivate righteous fire. So that's why Doriani's lessons is it's so that way we can, we can reactivate righteous fire. The way it simply works is righteous fire when we have one life won't activate. We hit an enemy, it leeches some life. We can activate it and thus have the spell damage multiplier. Lance, you doing all right, buddy? I was kind of see how well he would do sitting on my lap while I'm explaining this. He's doing decent, but I might have to put him down because he's a little bit distracting for me. Um. Other key components of the build I should mention are Bismuth Flask. Part of the downside of Melding of the Flesh is it comes with a big minus 70 RS. This makes your resistances kind of hard to cap, but since we're already investing into basically permanent uptime on our flasks pretty consistently, we can then use a Bismuth Flask to balance our res. Normal builds, I never recommend this. It's never a good idea to balance your res with a flask unless you can guarantee permanent uptime, which we can thanks to this keystone. So the 35 all res plus the extra, we can get up to 40 on a suffix. That's a good 75 all res. That basically negates the downside of melding the flesh and it makes gearing a lot easier. Gearing a lot easier because we like to scale strength and int. I said this earlier, Radiant Faith com combines very well synergistically with Righteous Providence. Strength and Int are stats that give you percent energy shield and flat life. We care about both those stats because flat life means more life to get more ES from Ivory Tower. And it also means Int is percent energy shield scaling the flat ES we're getting. And that synergizes with Righteous Providence, a node that gives us 1% crit chance per our lowest stat. So with a character like we have here, where we have 491 strength, and 519 int, we're actually getting 491% crit chance. These are the linchpin of the jewel in terms of damage. You can make this build, the defenses will all work without this, but if you want good crit, you need these jewels, and I think they are far and away the most limiting factor of the build, the most expensive price point of the build. I think you can get away swapping in an increased crit strike support. You can probably get your way to a decent crit chance without this jewel, but it's gonna cost you quite a bit of damage, I would imagine. I could be wrong, but it's going to cost you some damage. Of course, we have overkill damage. I think you could still get plenty of damage to do all the content, and you're not going to die to the content, so it can work, but I want to make note of that here because this is part of what makes the build so expensive are these Forbidden Flames and Forbidden Flesh Jewels. So that's why on my gearing, I'm trying to get strength in it. I didn't do a perfect job. A lot of gear pieces didn't end up getting a good strength in it number. Things like my rings, I could metacraft to do the suffixes better, but I didn't really want to take the investment. The build was already doing so well. I could metacraft my belt to try to get better life on it. There's improvements we could make to this character, but I was just happy with how it was performing. I think Lance wants me to put him down. Here you go, little guy. You weren't sure if you wanted me to put you down? Okay, I'll pick you back up. So, hopefully that explains sort of the building blocks of the character. Now, I'm gonna go over to Path of Building to try to break down the guide information I laid out for you guys. So I took some time in PUB to try to write out all the key pieces of this build, key pieces being the things I just went over with you a little bit earlier in the video, and then also things like, hey, how do I level this build? Well, the answer, simply put, is the build doesn't work from a leveling perspective because all the core pieces of the build are like level 60 plus requirement. Really, I would just recommend level as some generic lightning-based spellcaster or level as hollow palm. Just get to the level where you can equip the gear pieces, then respec your build to go into this character. That's why I'm only going to be offering level 70 plus uh, trees because I don't want you to try to make this character from level 1, follow the tree, and you're going to just have a bad time from 1 to 70. I recommend leveling to something else and respec. Next up, I'm going to go over gem links. So basically just outlining what these utility skills do, what these auras do, movement skills, DPS, setup, all that sort of thing. If you're saying, hey, I don't like ball lightning, I want to try some other skill, the moral of the story is the scaling for this build is very generic. You can do a cold spell, you can do a lightning spell, all those things will work in this character. It's just going to be a matter of A, switching yeah. your gem links, and B, the one specific thing for lightning is scintillating idea. You can switch this for a cold notable, like the one that gives you 10 pen, something like that. Really, you don't have to be specific to just lightning. Um, going over our next things, we have miscellaneous information, just common questions I get. I'll try to add to this if I get more questions that I'm seeing a lot that I haven't answered here. Um, this is where you find out bandits, Pantheon, RFs getting turned off, etc., etc. Mods to avoid. I actually can take away Elemental Reflect. I, I, 
I, um, so you know how Tempest Shield can kill the Elder Guardians? Well, moral of the story is it can also kill me. I did it Ziri, and I was thinking, okay, I'll just shoot away from it, Ziri. My ball lightnings won't PK me. And then Tempest Shield's like, nah, man, I'm going to shoot the Mirror Clone. And it shot me in the head. So I ended up, um, I probably should go on to D&D. I ended up switching the character's tree just to go for Reflect Immune, which was ended up dropping these crit nodes for these elemental nodes here, grabbing ourselves the Reduce to fly, Reflect, and instead of Tukohama, we grab Yugal, which makes us effectively curse immune and also reflect immune, which means, hey, there's just less mabs we worry about. We can just run at Ziri whenever we want to. It's not maybe quite as good as the crit multi, but it still works out pretty well damage wise. Our shocks end up being closer to 50% on most endgame bosses and the percent damage isn't bad either. Yeah, you like that, don't you? Lance is all about being reflect immune. He's not playing games. Uh, other things we can note in here is cost of the build is a question I've been asked a lot. I tried to break down what the baseline cost is, and what I came up with was 20x. 20x minimum if you want to start the build at a basic version that doesn't use Righteous Providence. That's what I would say you're going to need. And then after that, if you start going for the exact version I have here, I tried to price out basically the more expensive pieces for what I spent, along with adjusting for what the new the price hikes like if stuff increases in price for example righteous providence i bought both of my jewels for 4x so they weren't too expensive but just now i checked the market and they were like 10x plus or something they were a lot more expensive and so i tried to account for that i may have like spent less than this but i was thinking you know what all in all if we're increasing for inflation maybe like 90x is what the current setup of the build costs that could all change the market's pretty volatile stuff can go up stuff can go down Really, you're gonna have to do your own research, look up items individually to check, hey, how expensive is this now? Can I afford it? All right, now, going beyond my setup, this is basically just a small section where I just wrote out some simple things you could do to uh, <laughs> to upgrade past what I have here. Things like an, a 15% aura effect, synth helmet could be one, 16% aura effect on your brutal restraint instead of eight, that would allow you to drop introspection, a plus four ivory tower, a nebulous with spell double damage, Things like metacrafting my rings and prefixes to get the suffixes and the prefixes better on those items. And leveling to 100, you can always get a lot of crit mastery. There's a lot of points that are powerful for us. What do you need, little guy? You want to be back on my lap, okay. Okay, fine. I'll put you back on it. He's just making a lot of weird noises. Yeah. And then I also went over crafting the rares. For crafting the rares, I try to go step by step how to craft exactly what I did when I crafted my items. Hopefully it gives you a good idea of how to approach this and with a good methodical method of, okay, step by step, this is how I recreate this gear. And also I went through extra steps if you wanted to take it beyond my gear. For example, I go over the steps to do the meta crafting for the prefixes or the suffixes, which I didn't do on my belts or rings, for example. So. Hopefully that gives you a good breakdown of how to remake the character, how much you can expect in cost, all that sort of stuff. Um, I will include trees from 70 to this character now, and uh, hopefully that gives you a good breakdown of what we're doing with the character. Now let's go back in game here, and um, I'm gonna try to make sure I cover everything. I think one thing I forgot to go over was Ashes of the Stars. This amulet is super powerful. It A, helps us get more reservation space. It B, quality to skill gems. Most powerful style on this ring, or on this amulet by far. There's so much value you get out of being able to add extra quality to things. For example, Divergent Ball Lightning. We get an extra 15% chance for the Ball Lightnings to be supercharged. That's 50% AOE, 50% more damage. It's a huge buff to the, or boost to Ball Lightning's DPS. There's also things like buffing our divergent tempest shield that's an extra three spell block we weren't going to have which helps us get closer to spell block cap without investing into our tree this goes on and on for things like defiance banner things like uh, flame dash our cooldown on that feels better there's so much quality of life that comes with quality on your gems i can't recommend this jewel enough and then one other small key point i want to make note of is fitting in all the auras i have one, you can improve this by A, upgrading 
uh, enlightens from threes to fours. I only did level three enlightens. Uh, level fours would help you fit everything in better. That way you can invest less into uh, reservation mana reservation efficiency. And then also things like getting corrupted implicits like reservation efficiency on the unique jewels where you can. I have one on my melding of the flesh and one on my uh, abyssal jewel and my stygian vise. So hopefully that breaks down the character bit by bit. Lance is a big fan, hopefully. He's not sure about it. But I did just realize I forgot to do a mapping showcase in the intro of this video I made. So I'll go ahead and run. I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a constrictor or something. He has attack and cast speed, AoE, temp chains. So this will give you a good idea of what the character looks like if I were to run this map. I'll just put flame dash onto here. That way I can still flame dash around since I'm carrying Lance. And I can play this just with one hand. It won't be a perfect showcase because we're going to be missing out on um, shield charge. But it'll give you a good idea of what ball lightning looks like in terms of clear. Now, I don't play ball lightning with... Um, I play it with slower prods. This is for DPS. If you wanted to while mapping, you could probably swap out that support. So that way the ball lightning hits enemies faster. I don't think it's really necessary. Like, I usually just... I cast once and then I, like, run through the monsters. I don't... I don't pay much mind to like, not having the ball instantly kill everything farther away because they're going to get there eventually. They're going to keep moving as you shoot them. So there's not too much of an issue there. Um, yeah. One thing I should note is in the POB, I'm going to recommend you can either do. Yeah, Mama's here. Go find her, Lance. I think he heard my wife behind me. But more of the stories I was going to say. Um, Molten Shell or Smite. Smite, is, this is a basically a gem swap. I decided I should include his recommendations. If you want to do like tanking the biggest heavy hits in the game, you can swap in Molten Shell and just proc those whenever you're about to tank. Like a serious meter, I don't think we even need a Molten Shell for that one, but I think double Uber Zeri Flame Blast, we would probably need Molten Shell. So if you want to tank those sorts of abilities, you can swap in Molten Shell here instead of Smite, or if you just want to go the DPS route, you can use Smite as well, or just whenever you want like 30% more damage. It's quite a bit of extra damage, so just want to recommend that there's that potential as well for a gem swap. Really just make it your own. Say you don't you don't care for shield charge as a movement skill, then you free up two, two um, gem slots, and then maybe you don't need an unset ring, and you can go for over a million for your second ring. There's a whole lot of variety, whole different, a whole bunch of different ways you can take this build. Really, as always, I want people to make the builds their own. Make it something you enjoy and you like. I have a working skeleton. I have something that has very strong potential. And you can just adjust it to whatever works for you. You know, don't don't be stuck in the, I have to do exactly what this guy does. But also at the same time, make sure you're understanding the reason why I do certain things I do is because it works. So if something stops working because you change something, then maybe you might have missed something for the importance of the reason I did something I did. I don't know if that makes sense, but the idea is I want you to feel free to change things and experiment, but also know if you if you change a bunch of things, don't blame me if it suddenly doesn't work. Because I do have that habit sometimes where people are like, ah, this build sucks, or whatever, and they blatantly changed a core mechanic that makes the build function. It's, it's a bit frustrating. Okay, so anyways, that soapbox out of the way. Um, I guess this hopefully gave you a little bit of an idea of what the, uh, what the, um, I guess clear of the build looks like. It's not OP clear. It's just good enough. You just cast once and then it kills things on screen. I don't really, uh, stress about it too much. I'm mostly, when I'm playing PoE, I just do, I don't know, content I like. One of my favorite things is bossing, so I tend to make builds better at that. This definitely is more of a bosser than it is a map farmer, but it does map farming fine as well. You can run most map mods. There's a few I'm going to recommend avoiding, like no regen, for example. Although technically, you probably could run no regen. You would just need to swap in a mana plus for your quicksilver type of thing. Because Aegis is going to sustain your ES, even if Righteous Fire is degening you, I would imagine, from enemies hitting you. Um, so, that is, I guess, hopefully a good showcase of what the character is. How it operates hopefully i've broken down and explained it well um there's other key pieces like a go over like hey uh, nebulous gives you 300 percent 
lightning damage. It's a really good item for not too much currency when you're getting 90 lightning res. There's other things like, hey, crafting with the new currencies, you can make really powerful items. We're getting Unnerve, Exposure. Those are powerful mods that really didn't cost me that much to roll onto the item with the new uh, Exarc and Eater currencies. There's other things like mana efficiency, cast speed, action speed, regen. Definitely look at the mods I have on my items. Those are the things I thought were the best, but also check out, check out PUDB for other mods possible. Maybe there's some other ones that you might rather have on your items, so on and so forth. Here's your bottle, little guy. Are you reaching for this? Yeah? Okay, well, anyways, that's the video. As always, thank you for watching. Take care, exiles. I will see you in the next one. Hopefully you enjoy this build. Sound.